<clears throat> Grace and peace to you. Um, peace, which is a, a clear conscience before God because of what Jesus has done for us. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> um, silence can be a really awful thing. Maybe, maybe you've called somebody on the phone before you had a really important message to tell them and they didn't answer or maybe they took a really long time to return your call. If that's ever happened to you, I mean, just, just, has that happened to you? You had something really important to say to somebody and they either didn't answer, didn't, took a long time. Do you remember feeling like maybe you did something wrong? Like maybe there was a reason why they weren't taking your call or responding to you and, and maybe you had, had done something to offend them and they were mad at you? <clears throat> this is probably especially true now with, with text messaging, which I would imagine uh, some or many of you do. But text messaging gives us this quick access to people, and, and we often think that they're supposed to be, reply really, really quickly to the messages we send. So uh, have you ever sent a really important text message to someone, and they didn't reply right away? Do you, do you ever remember feeling like, like maybe you did something wrong, um, be, that they weren't replying, that, that the silence almost turned into judgment? There's even these new features now on phones that aren't that new. Man, I'm just probably dating myself. But, it, you know, where it shows you that your message has been read. <laughs> that makes it even worse when you know the other person has already seen it. They've read your message and then maybe they still aren't replying. Studies even show that these features have increased and heightened anxiety and stress for people. Why are they not responding? Did I do something to offend them? Am I not as important to them as I thought I was? Silence can be an awful thing, can't it? Uh, it can lead to all sorts of anxiety and fear. It can lead us to wonder all sorts of things. But sometimes it seems like God has gone silent. Sometimes, sometimes it seems... Like God isn't interested in communicating with us. And sometimes it can even feel like God has turned his back toward us. And if you've never gone through that, I'm, I'm thankful. But it, it could happen someday. That it would feel like God has turned his back toward you. And it can lead us to wonder all sorts of things and be filled with all sorts of fear and anxiety, kind of like the men that we heard about in the reading from John chapter 20. Can you, can you picture those men in the room? I mean, let's just try and do that in our mind's eye for a second. Picture, try to picture grown men bolted with doors bolted shut, curtains drawn, because they are terrified. Maybe they were replaying some of the things that had happened in the last couple days. Maybe they were thinking about how they promised Jesus that they would be willing to die with him if it came to that, and then how they ran away at the first sign of danger. Or maybe they were beating themselves up about how they had done nothing to prevent his arrest in his crucifixion, how some of them even denied knowing him. Or maybe they were wondering about the, the message that the women had told them earlier that day, that they had gone to Jesus' tomb and his body wasn't there, and an angel appeared to them and told them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Christ is risen. Maybe they were wondering about that, but, but if it was true then why hadn't Jesus appeared to them? Maybe that was their question. And then there's Thomas. <laughs> you got to feel bad for him. I mean, he was the only one who wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the rest. And then he spent the next seven days experiencing silence from God, okay? And I know that we know how the story turns out, but what do you think those seven days were like for Thomas? 
Seven days of silence from God. Do you think maybe he wondered, did I do something wrong? You know, is, is there a reason that Jesus appeared to the others but not to me? Is God, is God finally giving up on me? Is he, is he maybe paying me back for the foolish things that I've done? I don't know what, what Thomas was thinking, but I'm sure that that period of silence led him to all sorts of anxiety and fear and doubt. And all of those things, silence can be an awful thing, and it, and it can feel like you're locked in a room with your secrets and shame and loneliness. And so sometimes, when it seems like God has gone silent, we become really eager to speak for God, to create messages that we think God would want us to hear, plans we think that God would approve of. And do you know what's a perfect example of that in the Bible? Abraham and Sarah. We heard, we heard about Abram receiving this promise from God that, that he would have a son from his own body. But, but after years passed and Sarah didn't conceive, it probably seemed to them as though God had gone silent. And do you know what happens in Genesis 16? <laughs> we didn't read that chapter. Sarah and Abram come up with an own, their own plan. They figure this is how, this is how, this is, this would be what God would want us to do. And Sarah tells Abram, her husband, to sleep with her maidservant, Hagar, and they'll build a family through her. The only problem is, God never said to do that. And it led to all sorts of conflict and tension and strife in their marriage and in their life. Sort of like the messages that we create when, when it seems like God has gone silent. And they can be as crass as, you know, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you try your best to be a good person. God never said that. But usually they're more subtle. And they kind of have an, an if-then sort of feel to them. If I could just get more people to like me, then maybe I'll finally like myself. If I could just lose 30 pounds and change this or that thing about my appearance, then maybe I won't be so ashamed when I look in the mirror. If I could just make sure I plan right for retirement, <clears throat> then I won't have to worry later on. If I could just <clears throat> make sure I have all my ducks in a row and follow through with parenting, then I can ensure that my children will turn out all right. If I could just get over my fears and my doubts, then maybe I could really start living finally or even performing better spiritually. Um, all these if-then messages that we craft that, that we think maybe God would even want us to hear, <clears throat> they don't end up helping in the long term, do they? If anything, they lead to pretending and comparing and judging others and ourselves by this false measure that we create. And so none of these messages that we craft line up with God's because we're not him. And I know that might seem obvious, <laughs> but if you think about it, who's sort of at the center of any one of those, those messages? Who, who, on whom do they depend? Us. And isn't it wanting to be like God when we think we can secure for ourselves peace and uh, security? Is that not wanting to be like God? And it's why God in the scripture says, 
Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. This whole thing is not riding on you. It's about receiving gifts from me. God's ways are different than our ways. And so um, we need him to break the silence and pierce the darkness with his light. And, and there's a story that's a, kind of a good example of how God's ways are not our ways. A man named Ro- Rod Rosenblatt tells a story. He's a, he's a professor at a seminary in California. Tells a story about when he was 17 years old. He, uh, he had been drinking with his friends and he decided to get behind the wheel and drive home. He was in no condition to drive, but he did anyways. And he uh, was in an accident and wrecked his car. Nobody was seriously injured in the accident, but Rod remembers calling his dad to tell his dad that he wrecked the car, he just totaled the car, and, and that he had been drinking. And his dad said, well... We'll talk about this when you get home. So you can imagine for a 17-year-old, there, there's the silence, right? That's the period of silence where now a 17-year-old, what's going through his head? What's dad going to say? Rod remembers walking into his house ashamed of what had happened and, and weeping. <clears throat> and he went into his father's study and his dad came over and hugged him and broke the silence and he said, Rod, what do you say tomorrow we go down and we buy you a new car? That's pretty interesting, huh? His father knew his son. He knew he was crushed and that he was probably waiting for his dad to let him have it. But his father knew his son and he knew what he needed to do to assure his son that he had not lost his love. His dad absorbed the expense of what had happened. He absorbed the cost. And, and so Rod remembers how surprised he was when his, dad, when his dad said what he did. He was expecting judgment. He was expecting condemnation, and his dad instead gave him gifts, forgiveness, and the gift of a new car that he knew he did not deserve at all. Do you think that Rod loved and respected his dad more after that or less? Do you think he loved and respected his dad more or less? You can just nod your head. Probably more. I I mean, I would think. I suppose that all of us have secrets that we hide and we have... um, skeletons in our closets. I'm pretty convinced that everybody sitting here today carries more shame and anxiety than we let on to. Because we don't want others to know. But here's the thing. God knows. He knows all about our secrets He knows all about the things that happen or have happened behind closed doors. He knows every ugly detail, and God doesn't run for the hills. (laughs) And he doesn't come in judgment, as we would expect. When God comes, when God breaks his silence, he doesn't do so just by speaking. He does so by appearing. He does so by appearing. Um, God is so real that you could take your fingers and you can put them right where the nails were. God is so real that you can take your hand and you can reach it up into the side that they pierced with a spear. Just ask Thomas. Just ask Thomas. When God comes to us, he surprises us with his gifts. Um... It's always a surprise the way God responds to our sin. I mean, just think about it for a second. It's always a surprise the way God responds to our sin. I had a, there was a woman who he was here in between services who's going through some stuff, and um, 
She said that uh, uh, she had invited a friend to come with her to church this morning, but he said, no, I'm not going to because I'm not cleaned up. I've got old clothes on. I didn't take a shower yet, and, and uh, I just don't think I should go to, to church right now. Isn't it weird how we think that we have to be clean to come into God's presence rather than the presence of God being what makes us clean? What a surprise, isn't it? What a beautiful surprise that we come here as we are and God loves us for Christ's sake. Jesus said to the apostles, he breathed on them. This was the gift. This was the gift of God. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Because what does the Holy Spirit do? He makes people holy. He makes people clean through faith in Christ. Did you know that, that the word for spirit in the Bible, it can also mean wind or breath? Did you know that already? Or did anybody ever tell you that? You guys are a little more with it than the first service was, so, so thanks for that. But they didn't say anything, and maybe it's because I'm down here. I don't know. I preached from the pulpit this morning. But has anybody ever said that to you, that the word for spirit, ruach in Hebrew? I'm going to give you some Greek this morning. Ruach, panoima in Greek. It can also mean breath and wind. And so what happens when wind blows through a windmill? It creates movement, energy, right? I mean, it, it makes energy. Um, what happens? Try this right now with me. Take a deep breath. Breathe it out. When we take a breath, it, it gets the blood flowing. It creates energy. It brings life into our bodies. When Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit on us, it creates energy, namely faith, to rest and rely in what God has done for us and confidence in the hope of life that never, ever, ever, ever ends. So when Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, he's saying, come to life. Be made new. Um, a lot of times when the pastor speaks something after we confess our sins, it's a little bit easy to miss it. But remember that when somebody stands in front of you as Christ's representative and they announce the forgiveness of sins, it's as though Jesus himself is speaking through that person. That's what Jesus was talking about. If, if you forgive anyone their sins, their sins are forgiven. So by Christ's authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Silence can be an awful thing, and it can lead to fear and anxiety uh, so that we lock ourselves in a room of <laughs> isolation and loneliness. But brothers and sisters, the resurrection of Jesus is God's final message to the world. It's his final message to you and me. And by his wounds, we've been healed. Peace be with you. You are justified forever and ever. And I'll just close with some words Jesus told his disciples before he left them. <clears throat> and that was, in this world you will have trouble. And Jesus wasn't blowing smoke, was he? Things are going to happen to you and me that, that, that are going to put us on our backs and on our knees. In this world, you'll have trouble, Jesus said, but <clears throat> take heart because I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Amen.